Good afternoon, everyone. To those rejoining, welcome back. And to those joining for the first time for the sessions today, I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Elsevier South Africa team. We would have hoped that this would have been in person, but we are really glad that you could join us on this virtual platform. My name is Dineshri Mudli. I'm the customer consultant for Elsevier. And joining me today are my colleagues, John Sturley, who is the account manager of Elsevier, Lucia Scumbi, a senior customer consultant for research intelligence, Dion Lubber, solution sales manager for research intelligence. Just a few notes before we begin. You will see a Q&A button on your screen. Please use it throughout the session if you have any questions for the speaker. We will be having another session today and we will have a 15 minute break in between sessions. You will be using the same Zoom link throughout the sessions today. So you can either remain joined during the break or you can disconnect and reconnect using the same Zoom link. The recording of today's presentations as well as the slides will be available on our platform tomorrow and they will be available for three days for downloads. We also encourage you to visit our virtual exhibition stand experience and I will put a link to that in the chat and this is where you can get more information about the Elsevier product portfolio. Now on your screen to view the speaker on the right hand side with the presentation on the left hand side, I will ask you to use uh, the view button on the top right corner of your screen and select the option which says side by side speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Today's speaker is Dr. Daisy Selematsela. She is a professor of practice for information and knowledge management and she's from the University of Johannesburg. Uh, Dr. Daisy Selematsela uh, for is returning for the second term. She is the executive director of library and information services at UNISA. Sorry about that. I see that there was a typo in our session send. So sorry about that. She has 27 years of experience in higher education sector and the national system of innovation. A professor of practice knowledge management. She has been instrumental in championing the open access mandate and research data management in South. Her role in academic citizenship involves board memberships of nonprofit organizations and service, servicing the board directors of the Confederation of Open Access Repositories, Committee on Data and International Science Council, and OCK ID. On the national level is a board member of Information Training and Outreach Center of Africa, as well as the South African National Library Consortium, and is the chairperson elect of Chelsea, which is the Committee for Higher Education Librarians of South Africa. She previously served on the board of the National Library of South Africa and Council of the National Archives of South Africa. So welcoming our speaker, speaker, Dr. Daisy Salamatsela. Thank you, colleagues. And welcome to my presentation, which is much more of a case study of what transpired for us to shift from the known reality to an unknown reality that we had to battle with. And that's what I'll be sharing with you as a case study. So this is where the University of South Africa is located. Those who don't know what UNISA, uh, UNISA campus looks like, and this is the UNISA campus in Pretoria. This is the head office of uh, the University of South Africa in Pretoria, and this is where they, that's what the campus looks like. And the library is at the back there. This is where the library is, where my CASA is. So I felt that it's important to give the context of UNISA because UNISA is a distance learning university and we don't operate like any other institution. So we're in a hotel environment and that's what even from the government mandate, we're always reminded of our mandate to ensure that we provide open distance learning. 
and it's still a challenge to this date because our students are expecting a different service, a service similar to what's prescribed at your traditional full-time residential universities. So I just want to share with you as context, our student reach from the University of South Africa, because that's what we service from the library academic side, what we service for graduateness, academic learning, research and innovation. So we register between 300 and 400,000 students per annum. Our examination centers spread across 270 centers nationally, including 32 correctional services facilities. So it's important for all of us to understand that UNISA does not operate like any other traditional university amongst the 26 universities that we have. We have presence in correctional services also, your prisons. And we also have 130 international centers where also our students can access and write their exams. However, this year, everything changed, like I indicated with a new normal, that our traditional mode of offering exams, they had to shift with a new normal to be online. Last year, we produced around 2,600 examination papers because we were still using the hybrid model with about 1.2 meters copies of such papers. The quantum of assignments we receive per annum is in the range of six to seven million. And remember then what I'm talking about here, it's the old, old way of doing things where it's still your hard copies and everything had to change from much, where everything moved now to online and also with the uh, assignments had to move online and everybody had to learn in between. We conducted last year about 90 graduation ceremonies. And this is the actual norm every year where we have close to 90, 95 ceremonies every year for the university. And this year, again, everything had to change. What about the library itself in support of those 300, between 300,000 and 400,000 students and academics because our staff complement is close to 6,000 staff complements and a fraction of that would be around about 60-40 uh, for support staff and academic staff. So for our library facilities and resources, we have 13 libraries in South Africa and one in Ethiopia. So what you see in the big screen that I showed you earlier, it's the main campus in Pretoria. And other than that, we had other branches around the country, which are branch libraries. We have two mobile libraries serving rural areas. And here with the mobile libraries, we are talking about the Western Cape and Polokwane area to go into the deeper parts of our services. We have over just over uh, close to uh, 3 million, it's just over 2.8 million items that we have cataloged. We have over 150,000 ebook titles. And this, as you can see, it's your individual ebooks, purchased and ebooks subscriptions. And we have over 100,000 annual titles. We have a well established institutional repository and a comprehensive library app, and the service is available on mobile devices for students to be able to access our resources. And we have an integrated information services on the university platform for students, which is MyUNISA. And you can see the picture of the mobile bus that we have. Our partnerships with public libraries and correctional services are quite key to a distance learning institution and looking at the dynamics that we are faced with in South Africa of the haves and the have nots when it comes to electronics, when it comes to internet access and connectivity and our student population at large. So we need to ensure that whatever we, we do, we look at our student numbers when we do partnerships with the municipalities, we look at where our students are coming from when they register and we analyze the data for the reach of where we can form partnerships. So currently we have uh, public library partnerships with 27 municipalities 
and metros in South Africa, and two more in Ethiopia. In total, we have a footprint of about 110 public library branches from these partnerships. And this is above, over and above, what we have as our traditional academic library space. And these are the public library partnerships for access for our students. And we also have uh, partnerships with the correctional services, your prisons, where 15 presents, our library presence in 15 prisons. And it's quite important for you to understand our service provision and how it gets impacted by any changes. The general services, in a nutshell, we offer a number and a vast array of memberships. And our memberships are attracted by people in industry, government departments, other universities, and private individuals who want to use and access our library resources. And with the memberships, we charge based on, we charge fee, and that's where we generate income for people to access on a feeder students access our library resources and there are also different criteria on what they can access and what they cannot access we all browsing we offer and what's different is because we are distance led services to our students all over the world we also have e-reserves that as part of P, uh, PQM, it's designed from our uh, collection development site with academic uh, departments. we we'll also offer archival services. And here we have a myriad of collections from digital collections to your traditional uh, services. And we're one of the few academic libraries that offer the audiovisual section. And we have a collection of music collections and so forth. And customer training is offered in various formats because of the diversity of our student population. And like I've alluded to the partnerships and access to other libraries. And we also proud to indicate that our personnel, uh, whom you call uh, subject librarians, and such librarians are in the front line of all these services. So when we look at your, what our personnel, what you would call subject, what's known as subject librarians, what they do, they do a lot of alert and current awareness services. They look at their information needs profiles, advanced subject searches, also provide client training, including everything on your resources to analysis and citation impact and so forth. They also provide research support services. And here it will be also around your research evaluation services tools and workshops and of recent that was core for the past 18 months was more the push towards e-visibility as if we knew that the pandemic was going to be on us. And with this e-visibility, we have seen a lot of uh, growth and tra trajectory in this regard. And also a development of lab guides from both the subject librarians and the search librarians. They also they're working on podcasts and departmental websites. Departmental websites here, we're talking about your academic uh, departments, your colleges, or what you, other people would call, refer to as faculties. We also, as part of service, contribute to my academic module sites because of the nature of the way that they are assigned and they deal with particular colleges. And they had then to populate my UNISA modules based on the college needs. And also looking at the structuring of requirements for course materials, and also input on the tutorial letter content assurance, which is key for our program quality mix. And the information search librarian are more on providing online information search requests and also training online. So these ones do not have any face-to-face -face interaction. They are more behind the scene, the back banners. And their major client base is the undergraduate students, and they provide training also behind on site on their laptops or computers. So, with the shift from what we've been doing hybrid, it's not that UNISA was not contributing to remote uh, learning and remote using of resources, 
but because of trying to accommodate our student needs and, com uh, and completeness and to ensure that our graduateness exists as what the university expects, we would then use the hybrid model. But with the lockdown, the inception of lockdown in South Africa on the 26th of March, our colleagues had to shift the mindset and start thinking afresh and anew on how we can actually provide ourselves because already they were providing but our students were operating in a different mode and i would say it's the culture of i'm used to this service and i want that service to be like that books must be posted to me photocopies must be uh, sent to me and so forth and with a shift with the pandemic and the lockdown we just want to share with you what we have here the usage statistics for the same time 2019 July up to July, beginning of there up to July versus 2020 July on services that we provided, distance learning on and how the trajectory fell into these ones. If you can look at the ebooks full text download for 2019 until July, we had we had just above 102,000. In 2020, that has already gone 400,000. So it's showing that how the movement of our clients shifted. The e-resources downloads also shifted from 1.7 million to just above 2 million in July compared to the same year. And our presence in the UNISA institutional repository and you can see there also that it was 281,000. And you can see the figure now, how it shifted now to the 2.51. And also you must remember that with the UNISA IR, what also gave us the, the edge was the, when we started now with the repositories globally, the repositories that were now harvesting articles that were about COVID, the articles that were written about COVID and so forth, and they were made available by the publish by, by the authors into the repositories and the repository networks actually shared that that must be made available through the available repositories. And that also played a major role in the usage of the UNISA IR and other IRs. When we look at content DM, and this is where we're looking at our digitized collections and so forth, and part of data research data management, the data sets that we have and so forth. And you can see the movement from 2019, just at seven, uh, just above 7,000. And 20, we have just about 12,000 in the access to the data sets and uh, the digitized content. And this would also link to the content that we have in our archives. The UNISA archives holds a number of, of archival material that no other library has or archives has in Africa. So we are also seeing the trajectory in that, that it, it just went up. The use of e-reserves, and this is central to UNISA, with part of the program quality mix that our collection developers and our subject librarians work with the academics or the colleges to ensure that uh, there's a collection that the students or can use. And here we're looking from 166,000 that moved to 228,000 on the e-reserves. The African Digital Library, Africa for us, and then the usage that it moved from 80,000 to our circulation things where we were used to students coming in requesting over the counter or submitting their request online and then collecting choosing an option of collecting or having postage or courier service and that dropped down drastically from 258,000 to 73,000 and this showed us a lot that we had to reflect on a number of things internally and also with the roles that we assume internally. So this is what's actually giving us the business intelligence of the services that we are providing and going forward, which services are key 
into the institution as we noticed in the past six months when the country was in lockdown. So what lessons have we learned in this regard? It's that uh, I just want to share the Dick Van Dyke TV episode that was aired in 1965. And this uh, sign post stage that you see here, you won't get tomorrow's job with yesterday's skills. It was a sign post that was in the room where this TV series was being shown. And it's resonating with us today, even though it was a 1965 sign postage that they had as part of their series there. But for us to actually see that if I'm still retaining my old skills and expecting to use them going forward in the 21st century, my services are doomed and my role is also doomed. And this is what the new normal had to shift us. So, but we had challenges and opportunities with this process, and especially with regards to the teaching and learning research and innovation, not forgetting community engagement. There was a must increase in our access, even though we have this 247 access through the library app and then uh, the online resources, there was a must increase in this. The e-reserves, there was a lot of work done also down because the focus has shifted to have more additional, to have additional electronic reserve material to replace unavailable physical recommended books. And that's where our fellow librarians had to work with the academics to make sure that they have the collection they require. And that's when people started understanding the migration and movement to e-resources other than your traditional hard copy books. And the lab guides were linked to my UNISA platform for information access. And now we, we were having this, but then it was robust now to ensure that you have updated things that needs to be there. The library app was used robustly provide access to students via mobile devices. And all the information that we had, we had to also start using our social media sites quite proactively. The update on available e-resources made, was made available on social media like I want to indicate. And our online search requests were provided through, throughout lockdown, we did provide the online search requests because that has been done behind the scenes and that was done even before lockdown as part of the way we have our two ways, the front line and the back line service delivery. And online training was provided vis-a-vis -vis what we used to do where there used to be bookings and people had to converge into a room. And the challenge was that with that model, where you have uh, your students or postgraduate students and academics having to converge in a room for training, they would book. When the day comes to pitch up for training, they will not pitch up because they have other obligations or the other obligation is much more important than the training. But what we saw with the online that was provided in the beginning via Zoom, and then more robustly using Microsoft Teams because everybody had to learn new skills. Everybody was new into Zoom, and the university introduced uh, Microsoft Teams, and everybody was trained on the use of Microsoft Teams. Others had to learn via osmosis and learn as they go on. And this is what our librarians actually did. And they had to start providing training using Microsoft Teams, and this was mainly, and the majority of the times were for postgraduate students and the researchers or our academics. And the first was one on one and group training. And we have seen a search and an, in the training compared when we had the physical training, because then people were dedicated and then they were working from home, even though our academics at UNISA work from home. But with this format, then they could do what they needed to do. And I could raise the issue that, for example, when it came to e-visibility, the use of ORCID ID was key because then it's part of our annual performance plan to ensure that we have a certain number, we reach a certain number of our academics having registered their ORCID IDs, because some of them, when they have to apply for funding or rating with the National Research Foundation of South Africa, they require their ORCID IDs. This was also for track because now they had the opportunity to interact one-on-one -on -one with their personal subject librarians 
on the training on how to have an ORCID ID and how to populate the, uh, the information in that. And we actually have one college that surpassed by June. One college was fully comprehensive, which was, was, was our school business leadership, had everybody having an ORCID ID and active also there. Like I said, learning of new skills was across from the academic side to the support staff where us as librarians fit in. We all had to learn by osmosis. We all had to learn how to use these tools and so forth. And these were the opportunities that we saw. And also the other opportunity that we picked up with this process was that uh, we thought that we're saving money. Our budgets were now being saved because we were expected by the university now to transfer monies travel monies, for example, training monies, for example, that were not going to be used for the pand pandemic to the university for other core business activities. And that's what the positive side was all about. But when it comes to the other side, which is the challenges that we picked up, since I spoke about the budgets, then things are changing now because we saw the positive side that people are no longer traveling, going to conferences. People are no longer purchasing stationery. People are working from home and so forth. And we had to do budget cuts, not budget cuts, but shifting the budgets and uh, indicating that we are going to use less because of the trainings and so forth and so forth. Now it has changed back because we are now expected to cut <clears throat> the budgets on the e-resources going forward. And the directive from the Ministry of Higher Education is that we have to cut now uh, close to 1.77 billion in the higher education sector. So all the universities involved, uh, we had to cut close to 1.77 billion in that regard. And that was committed last week. So these are the ripple effects where you see the positive side and then it flips over to the challenges. And now the issue is, how are we going to, what are we going to cut on? And we know what gets to be cut, it's services from the library. We need to start looking now at our e-resources. What are we cutting from the e-resources? So that's, and one positive that came until June was that the, the same Ministry of Higher Education gave project, uh, pro project proposals institutions to say, come up with a project proposal for purchasing of ebooks for undergraduate students so that they can have access to these resources and so forth. And that was in June, July. And we, were, we submitted our project proposal and we were given some seed funding to do that. Now the reversal in October, it's not what we had in July, August. Reality now is totally different on what our budgets are looking like and what they're supposed like from 2021 until 2023. Another challenge that we picked up other than the budgets is the lending and retaining of books. Because most of the books were now languishing in the post offices and also with the students holding on to the books and they are now worried that they might lose the books and so forth because there was no service being delivered. And like I said, the South African post office was not able to deliver or return books and students were accumulating or our clients overdue fines for books. Our mobile services were no longer in operation and that impacted on the service provision for those people who don't have access to a laptop or computer because our mobile services are providing those facilities when they visit there. And the on-site delivery of physical books was also challenged because now people could not access and they had to learn also the new way of using their cell phones to now critically make use of the library site. And public libraries partnerships were affected because we had other partnerships where, that were waiting to be signed off, their MOUs to be signed off, and also said the service that they provided there. And services to the Department of Correctional Services was also affected because prisons were also blocked and we could not also provide or send documents, books, to the students there. The book suppliers, publishers were affected by the global lockdown and we had to write memos to certain suppliers and publishers regarding the delivery of books and so forth. 
And at the time, we were not even aware of the quarantine process until we went through and looked at what the norm and standards were globally on how we have to handle the pandemic in libraries and so forth. And that's why we have to be creative on what we do. And for example, initiating the co library COVID testing to look at framework documents and SOP, service operating procedures, on how we can deal with uh, certain items. How do you deal with archival material? How do you handle a book that's returned over the counter? How do you handle a book that comes via mail or that's being delivered? When the delivery man arrives with a paper and you have to sign that paper, what do we do? And those are the things that we had to learn in the process. The other big part that was a main challenge was internet connectivity and the availability of laptops or workstations for our staff members. Some had to, as they were now working from home, they had to use their own equipment that they had at home. And those who had, uh, as part of their performance or operations had laptops, had to use that, but then they didn't have the data. And the university had to invest in ensuring that staff members had data, but that also came late into the process. That also came late into the process. And also this also impacted on student, the students because the university also had to ensure that students also have data to access all these resources. So there were pros and cons, and it affected the entire workflow. And how we try to mitigate some of the issues that we picked up, the biggest ones that we felt needed mitigation other than the risk mitigation of uh, the quarantine and so forth that we dealt with differently were the issues around the fines on the, on the books that were uh, issued. And we had to waive or waiver the fines and indicate to the clients that uh, if you, your book, so we waived, we, waived, we waived the fines based on the lockdown. But if you had books and fines before lockdown, was promulgated in South Africa, we could not waiver that fine, but we waived the fines for those who had books or library material in their possession when lockdown was promulgated. We also issued global extensions on books that are in possession of our students or our clients, and we implemented that because of the issue of uh, observing the country's lockdown regulations. And we needed to make sure that we adhere to the regulations and also not uh, disadvantage the students or our clients. And that's all I wanted to share with you that uh, with our movement towards what we expected to be doing as part of the Odell open distance learning environment and the hybrid model that we've been using in the library, the past six months shifted us, the exit actually shifted from the hybrid model to be fully online and provide some services. And even now as we speak, there are those uh, stud uh, staff members who are working from home and who have gadgets, and there are those who don't have uh, gadgets, and the university tried also to ensure that people have gadgets to be able to work from home. But the provisor was much more on the academic side to ensure that the academics have the tools of the trade to be able to deliver a service from home because they had to use a number of platforms to ensure that their courses are online and the students are writing exams online. So this was a collective effort from both the support side and the academic side. And I would end at that. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Daisy. And um, your presentation was really good. And I can also say from my side that I have seen the commitment of the librarians from UNISA to doing online training and. I can really see that they really pushed it during this time to try and meet the needs of all of their researchers and students. Um, I have put a, a, a comment into the chat box to ask if there are any questions for the speaker. Please, if you do have any, use the Q&A box. Or if you have any comments or you'd like to engage in discussion with the speaker, please do send a message in chat so that we can on YouTube. There are some comments coming through. I'll read them. Kayaletu says, thank you, Dr. Daisy. And I see Mariam. Doctor, thank you for sharing this lively presentation on our services. Please well summarized. Thanks again. 
This is Yumi from Ethiopia. Okay, so there are some nice comments coming through in the chat box. Does anyone have any questions for the speaker? We'll just give it a few minutes. Please use the Q&A box. Okay, we have a question. How were the UNISA librarians wellness supported by UNISA management during lockdown? Okay, when it comes to the UNISA wellness for staff, it's centrally coordinated and all the staff members had their emails. Uh, we, we would receive uh, e-connect emails or info web emails that are sent to all staff members under intercom because we have the university COVID team and all the guidelines, all the service operational requirements and so forth are centrally administered. And that links to the occupational health and safety because occupational health and safety is part of the section 16. That's a obligatory for each and every institution. So the university administers, administered site with that. That's the one that was filtering information even today with regards to all the emails and the information on what staff must be doing, the expectations around working from home, how it works and how do you deal with working from home with dilemmas and there are articles that they would send and share with staff. But other than that, also the, the guidelines and self-help guidelines on what to do when a staff member has contracted COVID and so forth. And I can say in as much as the investee is sending all this, the expectation from staff is that they expect another layer from the library to do something. And with the way the operations are, you can't ex ex expect that the library management to come up with something on their own because we all rely on the university structures. And that's the mandate that the university COVID group, which is linked to the occupational health and safety, they are the ones who are mandated to issue all these guidelines and all the emails regarding COVID and any other platform that needs to be there and the regulations. So for us is to read as, and it's the expectation of, or it was also an expectation of each and every staff member to engage with all that. And the main, our role was then to ensure that our staff members whom we are aware that they don't have access to connectivity, we had to talk to them via WhatsApp and alert them and so forth. Even though with via WhatsApp, it was a challenge because some staff members are saying, that's what we picked up on the ground. But why is my manager contacting me via, me, contact me via WhatsApp? This is a sinister agenda and so forth. So there's a two-way thing stream to this. So this is how the university handles. So from our side, it was the major part because of the university structure that they didn't want miscommunication and misinformation. We all had to adhere to what's coming from the university COVID uh, group and occupational health and safety into that access and info. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Selimatsela. I have a question also for you. I just wanted to find out um, when lockdown began in March, did you find it quite challenging in onboarding your undergrads for remote access, how to use um, the library resources via remote access, or did you find that they were already used to um, using the library resources remotely, or was it quite challenging? Okay. What I can raise, like I alluded to earlier, was the fact that uh, we have a hybrid system and we have different short student and you have a young student 
who understands the use of technologies. So we had to deal with all these kinds of students irrespective in the history of UNISA. And of recent, we're having more, much more younger students coming into UNISA who are wanting access to computers to do their own things and so forth. So the challenge for us that we picked up, the students wanted to access the library, not to peruse the shelves or anything, but to use their computers for their assignments and so forth. When it comes to mature students, it was a challenge and it will remain a challenge because traditionally they are used to sort of being spoon fed that uh, I don't have to go on the library catalog. I can just go to the library and ask somebody to assist me over the counter. And now they had to be trained and that's why this one-on-one, -on -one, it was not just training on the library resources, but also answering questions and then guiding people and then also training on how to use the library catalog itself to access the resources. Yes, we had challenges and the other issues that uh, our students range up to your senior citizens who are also used to coming, for example, to the archives, coming to the audiovisual library, wanting certain services and so forth. And now they can't access that and then you have to direct them now to the e-resources and also digitized collections that they can use, for example, for the archives. And it was also another thing for them. So yes, there were challenges and they will continue because of the setup that we are in in the country that we are not all on the same wavelength and also with the internet connectivity because there are those who suffered even when writing their exams. If we look at the university side with, with the writing of the exams, the university had to also jump to ensure that all the academics had to learn skills to put their exam papers online, students had to write exam on, uh, 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 online exams, which was much more difficult compared to the support side. So the onboarding was not smooth and it's still happening even now. It's a, it's a, it's a learning curve. It's still happening even now. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, do you have any advice for librarians that are here that are not used to working remotely and have had to work quickly to shift to this. Do you have any advice on how they could promote remote access options to students? It's different. Like I said, UNISA is a distance learning university and it's our mandate to offer distance learning and support, tuition and, and support uh, and learning in that regard of distance learning. But if a, a, a librarian comes from a traditional library where it's not distance learning, they have also arrangements on how things need to be done, but it will be difficult for me to say this is how they need to follow the process because we have different mandates. What I can say is that it's difficult working from home. And also other than working from home, providing online remote services is very taxing because we have to have the data to be able to do that. We also have to have the equipment to be able to provide that service and the tools and also your websites and the platforms that you need to be using, they need to be accessible. And I think for, for myself personally, the learning curve is how do you actually make your, whatever need, that needs to be accessible to have long-term long, long, uh, long -term sustainability. That it's not just once off now that you are troubleshooting because of the pandemic, but how do you sustain and not fall into the trap of going back because that's what university management at UNISA it's saying that we are not going backwards we are going forward with what has the, what the pandemic has pushed us to do that we were dragging our feet to do and when they, they don't expect a reversal of us having thousands of students pitching up into a library we need to make sure that the students access the services remotely wherever we can yes Thank you. Thanks for answering my questions. And um, there are no further questions that have come through in Q&A, but there are a few good comments for you on your wonderful presentation. And uh, Dr. Daisy, on behalf of my colleagues and myself, we'd just like to thank you for presenting. And uh, to the presenter, so to the participants, sorry, we will be having a 15 minute break to return at 15.15 Johannesburg time for our third and final session of today. 
I did make a mention uh, earlier on in the chat box that if you have colleagues that are wanting to join, please encourage them to register. Registration is still open. And thank you again for joining us. If you'd like to leave the session open until the break is over, you can do so, or you can exit and rejoin using the same link. Okay, we'll see you in the next session. Thanks. Thank you.